Yes, it's uh, 18.30 here, local time in Norway. <laughs> well, well, hello, and thank you everyone for participating uh, to this online lecture about historical and contemporary wood carving, sculptures and artisans. Before starting, I would like to say that uh, this event will be recorded. So if you do not want to be in the video, please disable your camera now. My name is Lara Domeneghetti, a wood carver and gilder from Italy. I'm welcoming everyone from Jarlite Handwerk School in Dovre, Norway, where I'm a guest tutor this week. This is going to be our first lecture about wood carvers and wood sculptures, hopefully in a series of events where active professionals and uh, artisans present themselves uh, and their practice. As practitioners of the wood carving craft, we know or at least might have experienced how isolated workshops can be and how little communication between wood carvers happens, uh, even within the country. If we compare it with the blacksmiths community, which is internationally active. Though this is not due to the lack of passionate artisans or skill, but probably because of the wood carvers lack of initiative until so far to start the conversation and showcase the variety of works produced. With the students here at Dovre, I have started to prepare lectures in the curric curriculum uh, subjects, and currently they are producing a Rococo piece. This is one of the reasons uh, why the first lecture will focus on artists and wood carving practitioner Sarah Davis from London, uh, who is taking a lot of inspiration from the Rococo style. Sarah is a wood carver and gilder, gilding teacher uh, at City and Guilds of London Art School, uh, the main wood carving school in the UK. She was awarded numerous prizes and was recently amongst the winners of the Greenland Gibbons wood carving competition. What a long name. Please feel free to write questions in the chat uh, during the lecture. We will get back to them at the end of the uh, short uh, Q&A. Thank you all and welcome Sarah. Thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I think just one thing quickly, if everyone could make sure they're muted, I think there's a bit of rustling in the background. Um, that will just help to make sure my face stays on the screen. Um, so Laura gave a brilliant introduction there about who I am as an artist and what I do as a, a teacher as well. So I'm going to start with screen sharing, just get going with the lecture. And give me one moment, we'll just remembering how to use PowerPoint after quite a long time of not using PowerPoint. <laughs> um, there we go, play from the start. Okay, so can everyone see the first screen? I've just given this lecture the kind of loose name of Unco Uncoiling Rococo, Rococo style of the 21st century by myself. So I will start with this ornament. So this is something that I carved in 2019 and it's very much inspired by the Rococo. So as an artist in general, I um, explore a lot of themes about, around recovery and renewal. And a lot of my work is very autobiographical and relates quite directly to my experiences with ill health. And this piece in particular was made one year after I'd had a stem cell transplant, which is quite um, an involved medical procedure, basically. So when I carved this, I was in the process of recovery and I felt like the Rococo style was the perfect sort of route to explore that process for me. Rococo is a very unbounded style. It's full of life, it's full of energy, it's asymmetrical. It very much mirrors our body and the way that we move. So I wanted to explore that in an ornament 
um, whilst I was going through the process of recovery. So this is quite simply called Rococo Fragment. It's carved in limewood and then it's carved, it's gilded um, with Kaplan, which is a white metal made from palladium and gold, and it doesn't tarnish like silver. So I really wanted it to have that otherworldly quality. So one of the main inspirations for that piece is this fragment of silver furniture. It's possibly from a fountain. Uh, now it's German Rococo. And what I like about the German Rococo style is it really goes to that next level. It's so fluid, it's full of life. And there's something about it being made from silver as well that goes to another level. Often when I'm thinking about styles and I'm designing an ornament, I like to look at other materials. I don't just look at wood carving because I think sometimes that could lead you into copying something, which is fine when you're learning as well. But if you really want to create something that's from your kind of own vision, looking at different materials and uh, mediums is really quite a nice way to get into thinking about how you can replicate something, but truly in a, in a unique way. And there's something about silver that I think almost has a carved like quality. I mean, of course, it's done in a completely different way. You, it's repoussé, so it's beaten out a sheet of metal and then tapped in and engraved from the other side. But there's something about the texture that, to me, seems very carved and very much full of life. Um, so you might be asking why snakes? I don't know. If I just go back to the very beginning, you'll see there is a snake flowing through the ornament as a whole. But I'd like to talk a little bit about my own personal experience with why I'm interested in using snakes. So you can also maybe see there is a snake mirror in the background. This is something I really enjoy working with. So the symbol that you see here is known as the Ouroboros. It's the snake that devours its own tail. Um, and it presents itself in multiple cultures is an ancient symbol and it has come to be understood as a, as a sort of talking about the eternal cycle of life, death and renewal. And I wanted to use that to sort of explore my own thoughts around renewal and rebirth. So the snake is a symbol that features in multiple cultures. It's very dualistic. It has that association with healing. Um, if we think about the rod of Asclepius, which is often used as a medical symbol. Um, and it also, of course, with Christianity, has that more negative connotation. So it's a very dualistic creature that I really enjoy using as a way to think about how I can talk about my own experience with renewal and recovery. So thinking about the Rococo and how snakes have been used in the Rococo, you don't really see them as much as you do in the Baroque um, and then in the neoclassical, if we're going to the other side and sort of later styles. But you do see it being used in, in the way that we expect to see it on um, vases, for example. They quite often have, although I say a functional use in, this, in the sense that here they're being represented as handles. Typically, you wouldn't want to pick the vase up using these handles, but they have a kind of, they suggest something functional. Now, these are designs by Francis Boucher, who was a very prominent Rococo French painter, but he also had quite a strong role in the French decorative arts. And that's what we have here, two designs from his book of vases published in 1738. So I was looking at these kind of influences at the time, thinking about how snakes work in the Rococo. And we see this typical unbounded, coiling, amazing naturalistic forms that are very asymmetrical. And that's sort of what I wanted to create in the work. So that I in the work. Um, with a little bit of feedback, I think there's one person that isn't muted. I think, Lara, you can mute everyone as you're the host. Um, so also I, at the time I was looking at um, uh, Tipolo. I hope I've said that properly, Lara, you might be able to correct me. But I wanted to look at how uh, snakes were represented from that more religious kind of moralistic side. So we have the Immaculate Conception here where um, the Virgin is triumphing over the serpent. But the serpent really has that quite, um, 
it has a very romantic quality to it. It's very fluid. It's quite dragon-like. Um, it's still kind of confronting the serpent in a slightly different way to the earlier and then later styles that we see. But for me, the serpent in this ornament, I'm not really concerned with it being moralistic or functional. I wanted it to talk about the serpent in a much more classical way, about it being something that's there as a healing presence. I wanted it to sort of flow across the ornament and act as a kind of healing presence or a, a calming presence, something that kind of cut through the ornament and snaked its way over all these undulating rochial forms. So just to bring it back to the Rococo, and we can't really talk about the Rococo without the swing by Fragonard. Uh, so this is in the Wallace collection, but it is very much a, a kind of iconic French piece of Rococo painting. And um, you might notice that there is no snake slivering through the glass grass, you know, there is nothing in this work that's trying to say something moralistic. It's very much about the tropes of Rococo that we come to sort of have in our head as a stereotypical idea. It's about the play, the frivolity, the novelty and the pink. And I want to talk about the colour pink quickly here because you may have noticed in the ornament that I designed and was talking about, there is that hue of pink. And for me, that was to bring it much closer to the body again. And there's something about the pinkness of Rococo that really talks of something very bodily. And I wanted to bring in another contemporary artist here. So Rachel Friedman is a contemporary sculptor, American sculptor, and they very much look to the Rococo to talk about ideas around fantasy, consumerism, and fetishism and this work, The Bleeding Shepherdess, kind of picks up on that Rococo pink, but uses it in a way to really talk about the body and maybe how we can think about those intimate areas of flesh and sort of desire and the body and all of those things that we kind of think about with the Rococo, but maybe don't quite see when we look at it at face value, but they're things that are very much hiding within. So with the ornament, I really wanted to pick up on that pink. So here I've got, a, I suppose it's a bit of a process shot and all of you are carvers and maybe you would go on to do some gilding as well. So the way that this was created, um, it was carved first in limewood and then layers of gesso and then the bowl. So if any of you have done gilding, you'll know that bowl is the clay um, it's sort of a liquid clay that you paint on top of the gesso in order to give a colour that the gold can sit on top of. And it's, you know, you can be so creative with the colour that you put underneath. You know, it doesn't just have to be the sort of red that we normally associate with gilding or even the yellow. I wanted to choose a colour that said more than just, just something decorative. Um, so by choosing this sort of deep, bodily pink, it makes the ornament more bodily. It's not just a Rococo ornament. It's talking about something internal. And then on top, we have the Kaplan, which I mentioned earlier. And that was as well trying to think about a material that gave a level of illusion. You know, I know I wasn't making this in silver, but I wanted it to talk of something mysterious. There's something so deceptive about um, gilding. You know, you could make objects look like another material. It really is something quite creative. And, and, and thinking about um, the labor as well associated with carving, you know, it takes such a long time. It's so labor intensive. And similarly with, with gilding, it's, it's, it's these processes that are very layered and take a lot of time. And, and for me, bringing those all together is a way to think about how my body was feeling at the time. So at face value, maybe it feels like it is an ornament, but in fact, it came together to create this fountain. Um, and fountains as well feature heavily in the Rococo, whether it's in the background of a painting or in an ornamental garden, or going back to the first ornament of inspiration I showed you, the. German piece of silverware that was 
perhaps a fragment from a table fountain. Um, so there was this big focus on water, the fluidity. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about why. I mean, fountains on the continent are, of course, incredibly common, but also the Rococo being such an unbounded time and politically this very sort of tumultuous time, or it was approaching this tumultuous time. And, and it, it just is quite interesting to think about how water plays into that and the fluidity. So moving on to water, um, this is one of my most recent pieces. So it is a carved octopus. Uh, so it was carved in 2021, it's carved in limewood. It's not gilded, it's just left as it was. So this was commissioned as part of the Grinling Gibbons 300 award, which Lara mentioned at the beginning. So for me, the octopus is very much the ultimate Rococo creature because if you've ever seen one in the wild or in the zoo, it moves with such unbounded fluidity. It really encapsulates what Rococo is about and the, the way that the colors shift and move and everything. And even though this octopus is quite a, um, a naturalistic work, I still wanted it to have an, a stylized element. So you can see the shells are carved in sort of quite an ornamental way. Um, and some of the um, octopus tentacles are kind of coiling as you would understand a, a volute would coil. So I was thinking about it as a sculpture, as something naturalistic, but also as something ornamental. And from a conceptual side, this work is very much about pain and how we understand the octopus to be an incredibly intelligent creature but it's only till recently that people have understood that they're sentient animals for a long time. In the UK, at least, they weren't considered sentient. So their experience of pain was sort of reduced. So for me, it's they're a wonderful creature to kind of talk about how pain is kind of categorically misunderstood, uh, especially from a kind of chronic pain point of view or even an invisible disability point of view and um, so really this work was it was a very personal piece and it was quite serendipitous in a way that I had this opportunity to carve it through the Grinling Gibbons Festival because it can be hard as a carver to find time to really focus on doing something that's completely personal to you time and other commissions and other jobs seem to get in the way but this was a really wonderful opportunity for me to focus on doing something that was so personal. So I mentioned Grinling Gibbons, so I want to just talk briefly about his work. Now he was very much an English Baroque carver. He wasn't a Rococo, or typically what you would understand as a Rococo carver, but there's something about his work that speaks to the Rococo, because it has that kind of unbounded fluidity. And also there is a lot of asymmetry in his work. And, um, by the time that he died, um, it was coming towards his, his, his work was sort of speaking to that sort of style that was, was on the horizon. And just a few more images of the octopus. Um, a final close up. So I have gone through at quite a fast pace, as I'm aware we're kind of strapped for time, but it also gives you the opportunity to ask any questions. And um, Lara, if you, <laughs> if you wanted to start, but also if anyone does have any questions, please write them in the chat, or if you're feeling brave, do ask them out, out loud, definitely. Well, thank you, Sarah. This was absolutely amazing and so, so inspiring. Wow. Thank you, really. Um, yes, uh, so if anybody doesn't want to say the question out loud, please feel free also to write it in the chat. Uh, what I would like to know now from you, Sarah, and uh, opening the Q&A here, uh, if you have any upcoming projects or artworks that are inspired by the Rococo style. So at the moment, well, so, I do work a lot in, in wood carving, but also I do take on a lot of different materials and processes um, and styles as well. 
So at the moment, the Rococo isn't quite as present in my work as it has been in the past, but I can feel the ideas are going towards Rococo because I've been drawing cartouches a lot recently. And there's something about Rococo cartouches that are so full of movement and joy. And I actually, if you want to have a sort of um, insight into designing, um, cartouches are a really nice place to start because there's something about them. There's a, there's a formal structure so you've got something to start with, but you can almost do whatever you want with the, the outsides. You know, if you're doing something that's Rococo, you can have the Rococo, you can have these wonderful scrolls. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. I just love designing cartouches. So mm. um, just please try and design some because they're so fun. But so at the moment, I'm, I'm trying to work up a design for a Rococo cartouche. Um, Again, because I feel like I want to explore something about the process of my own recovery. So the first ornament I spoke about was one year after my stem cell transplant. But now I'm at four years post stem cell transplant. And I think, you know, the process of recovery is is so non-linear. It's always evolving and changing. So I feel I want to return to the Rococo actually, because I think there's something about my body I want to explore. So I think that's why the style is starting to come back into my practice. And also I want to explore the octopus more and maybe um, combine it with something figurative yeah, um, like the, the human body. So, um, yeah, there's definitely yeah, there's a lot of things happening at the moment. There is one person here that uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, uh, that just uh, yeah talked to or, or uh, unmuted. I'm sorry. Um, I'm gonna stop the share. To do the yes. Okay. It seems that one of my students wants to join in into the conversation. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so, no, maybe later. Uh, no, but this is really interesting. What I was also telling to some of my students is to look up uh, one particular uh, wood carver on Instagram as well. I'm repeating his name uh, here again. It's Ale Alex and then the line on the bottom, wood carving, since he is posting so many uh, elements of Rococo. Um, this can be like, such a useful tool like you say to really uh, practice drawing rococo is such a, a free style of drawing it's not bound to these uh, uh, structural lines like uh, baroque so um uh, yeah and cartouches mm -hmm. like you said they are so uh, the, the the way they are built up like asymmetric uh, it, it really helps to learn composition as well. Uh, oh, I see here uh, a question in the chat. So uh, amazing work, Sarah, from uh, Sylvia. Uh, really enjoyed seeing how the Rococo has influenced your practice. I'm wondering if there was a preference in the Rococo period for the representation of fluid or shapeless animals like the snakes and octopuses. Mm. I think I'm not, I will, I, I'd say I wasn't really sure, to be honest. I think looking at the different styles, it's it's very much like that German style, like the the creatures do kind of start to emerge. I mean, Lara, you might be able to help me with the name of the palace, but there's that wonderful one in Germany. I don't, I don't think it's Saint Souci, but I think it's the, um, it's got all the one dolphins that are like spewing and things. I think it's something in particular about the German style that really has a level of exuberance and fluidity that certainly appealed to me. But the the, the creatures that seem to feature, are, it does tend to stick to the ornamental dolphins that we see kind of throughout history. It, I, I struggled to find um, snakes and certainly no octopus. Um, I suppose the snakes are often used for it in a for a different function. I suppose, and I think octopus didn't really 
perhaps weren't in fashion, I don't know. It's really fascinating. Um, I'm here looking at all the participants because I know there are some uh, from uh, my course here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So yeah, so th this is kind of one of the, the first lectures that um, it's just quite exciting to explore those connections between colleges and well as well and like the, the different approaches to sort of teaching and, and it, it, it's great to kind of connect. So it's really wonderful to see, you know, people on, on the screen kind of tuning in at this point. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really nice way to sort of create those connections that you say, Lara, like you mentioned, are quite hard to come by, especially within a niche community. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, um, we only have to grow in this field and we cannot do it uh, just alone. So mm -hmm. we need to communicate and share our works uh, and uh, not just uh, visually, but really meet up and, uh, and uh, yeah and share mm -hmm. our experience as well. Exactly, and, it, and it's like how you can be inspired so much by each other as well. Um, I've just noticed someone has raised their hand actually. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, a question from the sideline here. Um, not really about Rococo per se, but I, I just got curious by the, the carvings you showed because I've, <clears throat> I haven't, um, I haven't really, done and very much gilding myself so, so I've, I've never thought about wood carving as something going to be gilded and I started wondering if if you think about the composition or the the layout or the the, the execution of the ornament differently when you when they're going to be gilded because the way the the um the surfaces behave or or they're perceived quite differently when they're so uh, so shiny compared to just rough wood I would guess yeah, yeah, exactly. I think carving for something that's going to be gilded is very, it, well, it's quite different to if you're carving it to be left as the wood itself. So one of the main things is that you apply multiple layers of gesso. So that's obviously going to fill all of those crevices. So you have to carve a lot deeper and be quite dramatic, especially if there's sort of, um, you know, areas where you've kind of made these sort of small cuts that in a, a carved piece, read well and catch the light. Um, a lot of people actually cut detail into the gesso as opposed to into the wood. So on the ornament that I showed, the first one, a lot of those fine details were actually cut into the gesso. And also with the snakes, the scales were actually cut into the gesso. And gesso is something that carves um, really beautifully. You, you wet it and it carves a, a little bit like cheese in a way that doesn't sound like the, the nicest thing to carve but it, it's it's a quite it is quite a different process uh, it depends on like so if you look at historic styles so the french very much carved into the gesso so you get that real delicacy and that real fluidity but um i think correct me if i'm wrong lara but i think a lot of italian work was carved quite dramatically and then uh, the gesso applied and there wasn't a huge amount of cutting afterwards so it does vary from um like where where the carving is done um also um you can leave things a little bit rougher if you're gessoing which is quite nice and you can sand large areas as well whereas sanding well for me anyway is a bit you wouldn't want to sand a final a carving that you're leaving as bare wood because it takes away from that beautiful quality of cuts. Um, so yeah, it is it is definitely something to consider if you're looking to to gild a piece. Thank you. Uh, it's it's correct. So in uh, Italy, uh, uh, mostly it's like the, the amount of gesso put on sculptures. It's like it, it, it's uh, sometimes exaggerated. But uh, like I, I just remember some 
putty that I have seen. Uh, they can be like <laughs> uh, really layers and layers, almost like five millimeters uh, thick. Uh, but yes, that's um, that's because it's usually carved into, and the Boulogne uh, gesso is building up so quickly as well. So uh, there is a reason for it. Um, but uh, yeah, just a quick insight. Ah, another thing about this beautiful bowl uh, that you used uh, for the Rococo element. Um, it's so hard to get. Maybe this is interesting for uh, people who are interested in gilding as well. Um, I was looking everywhere. Do you know like some uh, possible suppliers? Um, I, don't, I think I would have to go into the shop and then send it to you because it should hopefully be in in the shop itself but it's not online is it no, um yeah no. these and um, these, yeah sorry no just these kind of yeah obscure bowls um, mm -hmm. that are so lovely and and bring such a different dimension to the work is yeah. they can be hard to come by i wouldn't i wouldn't know how to mix that either um i think that's the only way to maybe try and mix it I don't know, a touch of blue into a French red might give you a, a little get a bit of it, but I don't think so. They're very particular. These these they're they're the German bowls. Um really lovely quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I was um so for the ones interested, I was looking uh on uh, Kremer and um the supplier in uh, London, which is help me here, handovers. Uh, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, both of them don't supply it anymore. So if uh, anybody's researching into it or knows more about it, uh, they can share it here. So just because uh, I remember that bowl in particular and it, it just had such a beautiful quality. It was so pure and light and like mm. it really reflected light so well and mm. so strongly. So. Actually what Beatrice has put in the chat is a good call. Yeah, having yeah. A, a white bowl base and then mixing pigments, that could work. And there is something really nice about mixing your own colors in your own bowls. Um, like I was talking before about gilding being just such a layered process that you can create, um, you know, it's more than just gold on wood. It's 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 this, I mean, I talk about it quite romantically because I love it so much, but it, it really is a process of creating something um, more than, than, than just a, a decorative finish. It can be, you know, and with carving as well, it, 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 it can be more, it very much can be a process of observing and, copying and replicating it really depends on what sort of area you want to go in with carving but for me it really is this process of exploring something about like who I am as a human like if we think about wood carving it's such like a bodily experience you know you put so much power your own like strength into it and it's very labored it takes you know it can't well days if it's a small ornament but weeks months if it's a big project you're committing these chunks of your life to creating something so you're imbuing it with with you know an element of who you are I believe in that no matter what kind of style or 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 function the work has it really is um for me it really is linked to um pain as well I know I talk about pain and renewal and um health quite a lot with my work um but there is you know you're inflicting pain on a material but also sort of on yourself when you're using sharp objects and things it really speaks of something um that is related to pain i think and if we think about like the crucifixion as well a lot of the, the representations of christ and the cru crucifixion that we have in our head it's carved in wood so there is this real link I think to wood and pain and you know I know you won't look at something that's carved and think oh that's painful but um I just want to kind of put it out there so it gives you a just something to think about in relation to carving it, it can be more than the process it really is something that can be quite philosophical um for me anyway 
Uh, well, during uh, um, the classes here at Dovre, we have sometimes very, very philosophical uh, conversations. We talk about journeys and it's, mm -hmm. uh, it can be compared with struggles through life. So it definitely has that uh, element. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I think everybody who is at least uh, trying even for, for some time, they, they will kind of experience that and like um, also at school we we talk about stepping into fear and then overcoming it like how much material can I take away and and when is it gone like uh, when is it too far isn't it yeah. I think that is that it, it you know what you've touched upon there Lara is is really that thing that so many students do kind of grapple with and even like experience carvers I don't think it ever quite goes away um, that the unknown of carving and it carving is such a unique process because it's one of the only things where you're removing in order to create something um, so when you start out as a carver you're trying to kind of unlearn these things that we've come to do as, as children you know drawing painting even clay you know you're building up but there is something so unique about removing so of course there's those layers of fear and and trying to let people know it's okay because so often carvings are left with without enough drama because there's that fear to take off too much but actually if you just keep pushing it mm -hmm. then you know you'll get a lot more enjoyment out of the carvings but it, it's hard to kind of create that to feel that uh, to break through that Absolutely, yes. I'm just wondering if somebody wants to join uh, from my students. I'm really hoping I'm kind of like a pushy teacher. I'm like <laughs> pushing their boundaries constantly. It is scary to ask questions. It, it is really scary. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be about the Rococo if you want to pick our brains about any kind of carving things or just anything. Mm, maybe an interesting question uh, mm, that uh, could help also newcomers to, uh, to the wood carving craft. Uh, how long did it take you to carve each of these pieces that you just showed? Mm. Okay, so actually with the octopus, I almost have an exact number. Like I'm terrible at like tracking how long things take and also, also like the nature of other things that I do. I sadly can't work on things five days a week. So it's quite hard for me to sort of know exactly. But the octopus had a really tight deadline. Um, it, it, I think, so I had about two months to carve it. And obviously I was teaching and doing other things in that time. So. I think that took 31 days. So how many hours is that? If I say a typical eight hour day, eight times 30, well, oh my God, that's so many hours all of a sudden. So yeah. 80, 160, 240 hours for about that. And I think that includes design and modeling. I can't remember, um, but yeah, it, it, it took a long time um and was very intense and I think that's why that work means I've actually got it over there I just remembered it but it's in a box I'm sorry I can't unpack it right now um I just picked it up so it um the joy of um, being part of the Grinling Gibbons Festival is is that it was exhibited on two different occasions which is you know it's, it's wonderful to have wood carving put in the public eye because I think people wood carving is often you know on ornamental people don't look at it in the way that they look at maybe a painting or something so it was wonderful to have the opportunity for this work to be seen in a in a kind of context where people look at wood carving there were many other carvings on display and a lot of Grinling Gibbons himself and um, his works were also on display so it was a real celebration of wood carving um, um, but yeah I think that's why it means so much to me because it was so much labor went into it and um i cared so much about this idea that i'd been toying with for such a long time and i think that's also why i recorded the hours um mm. because mm. i just wanted to kind of quantify the energy that went into it and you know there were times when the stress was really 
quite physical feeling that stress and this pressure to create something for such a, a tight deadline and, and for it to really say what I wanted it to say. And, and I was, the outcome I feel was successful and, you know, and it's not an easy thing to say as someone who makes things, you know, we're always, you know, we're perfectionists, I suppose, but there was a sense of satisfaction with that work that I think is again why I have such a connection to it. Um, it, it just did what I wanted it to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I think we're soon uh, done here. We are. Um, yeah, there's another. I there's think another question. Yeah. 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 So let's just we'll see how long we can go before. Yeah. Things uh oh now all the questions come okay beautiful work and thanks uh the information tom kelly uh how much of the octopus was carved uh, to the design or was there any freedom during the carving process oh, that's a really good question yeah so the way i quite like to work is i really like to see the evolution from drawing clay model to final carved work um so i i started with a drawing just looking at octopus thinking about how can I create this creature that feels sort of full of energy and movement made out of a hard material you know it's it was a enjoyable challenge and then um because it was completely in the round I did make a clay model so I had something to reference um but there was a, a time in the process when I realized okay I can let go of the model now and I can just carve it and allow it to become something um, that felt a lot more um personal um i think the model was good to just kind of place in the, the basic anatomy and make sure i had room for all eight legs um but after a certain point um i did let go and i wanted the carving to really feel like something that was individual Thank you. There is another quick question here from Daria. Uh, if uh, the uh, documentary My Octopus Teacher inspired you uh, for the wood carving and if there was ever a time you were influenced by sound. Mm, well, that's really interesting actually. So I'll start with the sound element. So um, I made a, a, a piece of work about a year ago that was a, a, a sound piece so it was it was called day zero which again was uh, talking quite specifically about the process of having a stem cell transplant and I worked with a sound designer on that because um again I try not to limit myself to one medium and I think it, it's great to be if suddenly you feel like an idea manifests in in sound then it's brilliant to try and collaborate with people that can make that happen. And um, so for that work, um, sound was really um, kind of instrumental actually, and, and bringing in like water and fluidity. And um, I'll, I'll put a link to my website actually. So if you did want to have a listen to that and sort of see how it ties into the aquatic sort of ideas and things, then that it might make sense. I can't always articulate why sound made sense in that time, but I think it was just tapping into some another kind of sensory level that I felt sculpture just wasn't going to do the job at that time. Um, and my octopus teacher, it, it, it did, it's quite, the, the first thing that actually influenced me was um, Blue Planet 2, I don't know if you've seen that, where there's the, that's the first time I saw the process of an octopus covering itself in shells and then watching my octopus teacher kind of really like, hit home this incredible behavior. Um, and I watched the documentary um, and was pausing every time I was like, okay, that's a great pose. And I was drawing from the documentary as well. So that was like a wonderful serendipitous resource actually when, when I was designing it, yeah. We have another hand raised here. Jan Anders. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, sort of a follow up almost on, on what uh, Tom Kelly asked about. Uh, I personally haven't done very much um, uh, clay work as preparation for carving. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been taught mainly to, to work with drawings, but I've also experienced the limitations of just drawing and I'm, I'm sort of curious but not experienced in, in um, 
clay modeling for carving. Do you want to share share something on the on your process? Because I think that could also be quite beneficial for the three dimensional kind of carving mm -hmm. um, the Kokoko style actually is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's a real, it's a, it's a balance because I think there is something really quite exciting about working just from a drawing. It, it's more yeah. of a challenge, I think, and it's quite a good process to learn. But um, the times when I decide to do a clay model is if I really feel like there's a huge amount of drama and yeah. depth um, that's when I feel it really works because in the past when I've looked at um, student carvings or, or carvings we have at the college that I know were done from 2D they don't always have that drama as I think it, it's hard to kind of translate a drawing into something 3D sometimes and a really good exercise can actually be translating um, like a relief panel like creating a relief panel from a drawing or even a photograph or an image of an ornament and kind of um, going through that process yourself and and working up and just sort of thinking about okay like what level should that be what level should you know this part be and it really makes you think in 3D and then when you come to take it to a carving you sort of already done it in your head perhaps it's in reverse but you already kind of have the language there so I think it can be beneficial but like for the um, snake mirror for example I only modeled the head because I knew the body kind of sat on one plane so I wasn't too concerned with needing to really think about where all the levels sat um, and that's it you can model parts of something and um, if you don't want to go all the way you can sort of think about okay I really want to think about how that rakile element that kind of flows over a leaf let's model that quickly and you can do you can do so so quite often I do something called sketch modeling where you basically take a bit of clay and just think about the fundamental shapes you don't always have to take things to the um, stage of completion um, you can just think about something like how one thing folds over another um, and work a bit more fluid fluidly in that way because doing a whole model can take quite a long time. So I think the the octopus model took a full week. And if you want to work a little bit click quicker, then you can just maybe do a series of small models. Um, but yeah, there's it. that's the joy of play is that you can move it and you can shift it. And it just helps, it can ease you into a carving sometimes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to write my website in the chat quickly and that's where um, if you did want to listen to the sound piece um, it you can find a link on there um, or just have a look at some of the other carved pieces and uh, bronze cast pieces as well yes please check out uh, her work uh, it's uh, I really really enjoyed uh, the wiggle snake uh, mirror I'm, I'm just mentioning it mentioning it because you do have a lot of snakes uh, in your work and uh, they are all so different and uh, so inspiring so please check out uh, her work it's uh, it's really really amazing and the gilding you do <laughs> I do like I do like gilding and I do like snakes that's definitely what comes across if you go on my website but I think it's just because historically the snakes have been used in so many different ways like I do feel like I could carve snakes for the rest of my life and each one is saying something slightly different um I like that I have brought in an octopus and you'll actually see on the website I do sometimes um use wolves as well um and um, I, I suppose wolves seem like a slight anomaly if we're talking about this octopus in a way have that fluidity that we think about with snakes but I think wolves are another very allegorical creature um, so they're, my work is quite narrative I suppose and uh, wolves tell a particular story and feature quite heavily in history as well I guess but yeah. So just uh... It's good that the Zoom got extended because we thought this would yeah. shut down after 40 yeah, minutes. I, that's what I was expecting, like after 40 minutes. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, we just got some extra time. Um, maybe um, just interesting to share for modeling. Um, 
I'm currently using a self-drying modeling clay. And I find that uh, also super interesting for this uh, sketch modeling, like you say, because uh, you immediately have like uh, something that will also last uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's fairly easy to work with. It's a bit fibrous, it has that type of quality, but uh, also really, really uh, recommendable for this uh, type of uh, yeah, modeling that we're talking about. Yeah, it's good to think about because yeah, clay is is wonderful, but it has its limitations, I guess. And um, wax is also lovely to model with. If you're doing something very small scale, wax is brilliant actually, and you can really achieve those details. And um, of course, it won't it won't dry out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I'm just thinking. Uh... If we should maybe end it here, the lecture. Um, and uh, I want to thank everybody for participating uh, in this uh, first lecture. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it all. Um, our next uh, lecture will be held in April, and uh, it will uh, uh, will be uh, uh, about Wilf Gorlin's wood carving practice. You will hear closer to the date. Please feel free to spread the word uh, about uh, this uh, little wood carving community and about these lectures um, and invite other practitioners and craftspeople. The recording will be soon available. And again, Sarah, thank you so much for sharing uh, your work and inspiration. I see here, oh, uh, Jonandas, yes, you recommend also Yes, a uh, hybrid between wax and clay used in the field of industrial design. Thank you. This can be very, very useful. Yes. Again, yeah, thank you all. Have a really lovely evening and see you next time. Thank you. Thank Bye. Bye-bye.